At the 29th of April in 1855, a small flotilla of wooden barges and inflated goat skins left Mosul with destination Basra. Aboard were a large number of crates containing countless treasures from the recent archaeological excavations at Khorsabad. The flotilla was to make its way down the Tigris and then to be repacked at Baghdad and later from Basra to be shipped to Europe, to the Louvre in Paris, the British Museum in London and to Berlin. But these were troublesome times. There were widespread and ongoing uprisings against Ottoman rule in the Mesopotamian countries. And in the Black Sea, the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856 was now raging. Soon, disaster struck, causing perhaps the largest catastrophe in archaeological history. And the cause? Pirates. The mid-1800s was the peak of Mesopotamian archaeology. It was now that the search and identification of the ancient cities of Mesopotamia began. In the centre of this enterprise was the search for the Assyrian city of Nineveh, mentioned in the Bible but since long lost in the sands. Archaeology at the time lacked the scientific structure that we see today, and mostly took the form of a race for relics. The finds were primarily sent to the great museums of Europe, or so at least was the intention. This is a story of how everything went wrong and ended in disaster on the River Tigris. I am your host Morten Eriksson, welcome to Ancient History. The pioneer of Mesopotamian archaeology had been an Englishman named C.J. Rich, who had surveyed the ruins of Nabi Junus and Kujunjik. Next came the French vice-consul P.E. Botta, who started an actual excavation of Kujunjik in 1843, looking for the mythic Nineveh, mentioned in the Bible, but without success. He soon after moved his focus to Korsabad, where he began digging in early 1843. He soon stumbled upon the great palace of Sargon II, believing it was Nineveh. But as we know today, what he had found was dur Sharukin the great fortress capital of Sargon. At the same time, the Englishman Austin Henry Layard was digging at Butter's old site in Kujunjik, which we today know is, or was, actual Nineveh. In 1852, the new French consul, Victor Plas, replacing Botta, continued the work. Over the years, the French excavations had unprecedented success in Korsabad. Botta had found several human-headed bulls, winged genies, reliefs with hunting scenes and much more. By 1855, their work had uncovered more than 200 rooms in the palace. But all this material needed to get to the museums in Europe, more specifically the Louvre. So it is now that Plas loads eight barges in Mosul. The rafts used inflated goat skins to get buoyancy, a technique fittingly used since Assyrian times. Before them lay a journey on the river Tigris for some 950 kilometers. The first half of the trip went well, and they arrived in Baghdad on the 4th of May. Here, Plas received word that he had been reposted as consul in Moldavia because of the Crimean War. Another Frenchman, a teacher named Clement, was therefore entrusted to oversee the transport's remaining journey to Basra. In Baghdad, a large part of the finds were loaded onto a merchant ship named Manuel, although it was not the ship that had been promised plus, but rather of much lower standard, much of the cargo was loaded on it. Two winged bulls and two winged genies were kept on four large rafts that were to accompany the ship downstream. Adding to this, in Baghdad they also picked up 40 crates from the French excavations in Nimrud and of course Babylon. 
and about 40 crates from the British excavations at Koyunjik, donated to the Louvre, and about 80 crates bound for Berlin as a thank you for the Prussian support of the British. All in all, the load was now over 30 tons, or over 235 crates of invaluable antiques, leaving both the rafts and the ship severely overburdened. Everybody knew that the stretch from Baghdad to Basra would not be easy. Already before leaving Mosul, a dam in the Tigris had broken, making the flow of the river so violent that it was not clear if the transport would at all be possible. And due to the escalatory violent political situation in the south, Clement was also endowed with money and gifts to the local sheikhs patrolling the river that would demand bribes to let the convoy pass safely. In fact, the Pasha of Baghdad advised them not to go at all. But the cargo needed to get to Basra, and that soon. Consequently, the ship left Baghdad on the 13th of May, beginning its slow journey to Basra, some 500 kilometers downstream. The small convoy only managed to travel undisturbed for a week or so. The demands made by local tribes for toll soon began, and consequently also the plundering. During their journey, the ship was boarded several times, and soon Clement, who oversaw the transport, was out of cash. However, the tribesmen also stole food and other commercial goods that the ship had on board. With the treasure chest depleted, Clement was forced to send two men by foot to Alcurna, where they were supposed to raise more money to be used as bribes. Eventually, one of the men returned. But the other man deceived Clement and went to the local ruler, Sheikh Abu Saad, and told him about the convoy. So far, no tribe had been interested in the ancient treasures. These were generally left to be. Of more interest was the gold, the goods and the lumber that the convoy carried or rather, was built out of. This was true also for Abu Sa'd, and being hostile to the Ottomans, Abu Sa'd saw no reason to keep whatever promise they had made to the Europeans about safe passage. When the convoy eventually reached the area around Alkurna, located at the confluence of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, the crew of the Manuel must have seen what was about to happen. Pirates rammed the ship, which almost knocked the ship over, being seconds from capsizing it on the river. The marauders soon swarmed the ship, already struggling with its overload, in such numbers that it almost sank, while the crew and the archaeologists prepared to abandon ship. Amid the crash of the wooden hulls, the rushing waters of the river and the upset noise of combat, one pirate got hold of the helm and steered the ship aground on the western bank of the Tigris. While this happened, the buoyancy of the ship finally gave in, sinking the stern under the water in the stream, while only a small portion of the bow remained above the waterline. Now the crates carrying the antiques fell into the current and sank or was carried away by the waters, just to sink a bit further downstream. Although the four rafts managed to stay clear of the initial assault, they were soon raised by the ships of Abu Sa'd, and just past the confluence of Euphrates and Tigris, the first raft were run aground. The pirates stripped it of all its wood, leaving the winged genie on the riverbank, where it can still, heavily eroded, be seen today, apparently. A second raft was also stripped of its wood but survived for another day. It continued to float downstream before sinking, taking its treasures with it. The last two rafts made it all the way to the town Al-Makil, close to Basra, where they ran aground carrying one winged genie and one winged bull. With this, the adventure and assault were over. Sunk in the muddy waters of the two rivers, was now not only uncountable treasures of Mesopotamia's most influential sites,
but the combined efforts of over a decade of archaeological hardships and triumphs, and with it French archaeological activity in Mesopotamia. It was to be almost two decades before any official French excavation took place in these lands again. In the months that followed, several salvage attempts were made, but Clement managed to salvage just a few crates. Most of the goods had been lost to the river. The massive sculptures were either too heavy or lay too deep, and the lighter crates had been dispersed in the currents of the Tigris. All in all, less than 30 crates were saved, 28 to be exact, and these include the two rafts with the wing genie and the wing human bull that made it all the way to Makil, and these finds are the ones that can be seen in the Louvre today. Only one major salvage attempt has been made in more modern times. Over the years 1971 and 1972, a Japanese mission used state-of-the-art technology to survey the area. However, after a year's work, they were forced to conclude that after a hundred years it was impossible to locate the ship or any significant remains in the waters of the Tigris. <laughs> Hi again, if you like this video, hit that like button, share a link with your friends and don't forget to subscribe. And if you would like to help me to make even better documentaries about the past in the future, please consider joining me at Patreon. I've put a link to my site in the description below. See you in the next episode of Ancient History.